just out of curiosity, just out of curiosity, how many of you are in this room because of a band director? How many of you might not be in this room had your life not intersected with that person? So was it the music or was it the music teacher that got you? Yes is the answer. Which one was dominant? The teacher or the music? Say. The teacher. Well, if that's the truth, wouldn't it correlate that your students are in the same boat you were? And that somewhere along the line, some music teacher said, you know, you're talented. And we all went, oh, okay. And then we started to practice, and we got better and better and better. My contention is, it was probably the music teacher that ricocheted you this direction. Is there any of you that would have done anything else in life? You might have been an accountant or a doctor or a lawyer. Let me see. I'm just interested. Put them up. I really put them up. That's over half the room. So that's how important you are. And I don't, I don't want the flag to drop and impossible dreams start playing. But I'm telling you, it was like when Joel said, you know, we do these leadership things and all the naysayers say, well, yeah, but it didn't last nor do showers, <laughs> nor does food. You have to keep re-upping. And that's why I think it's so great that you're here. You, cre you, you keep re-upping. Um, everybody wants st certain stories. This is how important you are. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm a band director. I mean, everybody still, what do you do? Well, I'm still a band director. I never knew how important the band director was until we had a little girl. Well. My wife and I don't have children, but we picked up strays along the way that nobody wanted. And when Mallory went, <laughs> said she came home, she's 12 years old. Now, this is how important you are. And understand, I, I'm a great fan of the person I'm talking about. She came home sixth grade. We have supper in Indiana. We don't have dinner. So we're sitting at the supper table, and Mallory says, and Andy, she said, um, they're talking about having band in school. Should I be in the band I'm coming right up over the end of that table. My wife's going, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. This is her decision. And I'm like, no 12-year-old can make a decision like that. I will make the decision for her, right? So that night, Andrea's going, Tim, what's the big deal? I said, dang it, if she doesn't get in there now, there's that one moment, that one moment of fertility, yeah? And if you don't sign up then, there's dang little chance you're ever going to be in a band again the rest of your life. So I'm like, okay, I'll keep my mouth shut, I'll keep my mouth shut. So the next night we're sitting there and everybody's jabbering. I'm like, God, priest, I said, Mal, I said, um, how'd that, that band thing happen? She goes, oh yeah, oh, she said it was great. She said, you, the, Uncle Tim, they came and they took us down and they had all the instruments and we got to try them out, everybody. And I said, what'd you decide, sweetie? She goes, I'm gonna be in the band. I'm like, that's my girl, yeah. I said, what instrument did you choose? And she said, the flute. Oh, God, not the flute. I said, Mal, did you try the oboe? Bassoon? French horn? She said, I tried all three of those, and she said, I don't like them. And I said, babes, people who play them professionally don't like them. That's not, <laughs> that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking scholarship. So, so that night, pillow talk is Andrea goes, what makes the difference what she plays? I said, this is Indiana. Flute players become flags. I know exactly what's going to happen. Well, so I said, okay, I'll, I'll buy into it if we, she has to take flute lessons. She's just not going to sit in the back of the band and toot along. We're going to get serious about this. Okay. So she comes home from her first flute lesson with her Essential Elements book, and she goes, Aunt Andy. She goes, you're not going to believe this. One of the guys that wrote the book has the same name Uncle Tim has. <laughs> and my wife says, Mallory, that is your Uncle Tim. She goes, no, it's not. I asked my band director, and he said, that guy's dead. <laughs> Can't argue with that. Some of you know Doug Hassell. He was the band director. Doug's a phenomenal band director. And Mr. Hassell this, and Mr. Hassell this. And everything that, you're all Mr. Hassell. Everything that Mr. Hassell said overrode everything that I said, right? So, goes into high school. I come home, run my little blabber tours. I come home, I walk in the house, and there's a flag leaning up against the wall. Mallory, get in here. I said, 
what is that? She goes, it's called a flag. No, I know what it is for God's sake. Why is it in our home? Mr. Hassell. Mr. Hassell said I could make more of a difference as a flag during marching band because we have so many flute players. Well, Mr. Hassell didn't buy you a $3,000 pipe to blow on. But Mr. Hassell, and Uncle Tim, you're the one that always talks about cooperation. Now she's laying my same crap right back in my face, right? So we get through that. Junior year, I come home. I walk in. On the counter is a clarinet. Mallory, get in here. I said, before I ask you what that is, I know what it is. Why is it here? Mr. Hassell. Mr. Hassell said we have too many flutes. Who would be willing to jump over and learn to play clarinet? I said, sweetheart, we, you've got private flute lessons. You're playing first chair. Flute. But Mr. Hassell said. So that night I hear squeaking and squawking in there. And I go in, there's a gnashing of teeth. And she's crying. I said, what's going on? I can't get it, I can't, this is so hard. I said, Give it here. And it was just a piece of junk. Are you serious about this? What's she going to say? Well, of course, because Mr. Hassell said so. You go ask Mr. Hassell what kind of clarinet you should have. So she comes home the next night. She's got a piece of paper, and she goes, I got it, Buffett. <laughs> I said, it's not Buffett. It's buffet, and you are not getting a buffet clarinet. <laughs> but Mr. Hassell said we all need match. Uh, I'm sorry. There's two reasons, babes, you're not getting this. One is they're incredibly expensive. Number two is, Uncle Tim works for Con Selmer. <laughs> <laughs> but Mr. Hassell, so I bought her a buffet clarinet. Okay, now we're moving on here. <laughs> I'm serious. I cannot override what you said. <laughs> She's just incredible. So she wants to go to college. Where do you want to go to college? I'm going to be an elementary music teacher. I said, sweetheart, Ball State University, right down the road. Uncle Tim teaches there sometimes. Man, this is great. You're far enough. Oh, no, no, no. Couldn't hear it. Couldn't hear it. Senior year, I come home in April. I walk in. She's got a Ball State sweatshirt on. I said, what's this all about? She said, I talked to Mr. Hassell. He thinks that's a good school for me to go to. <laughs> that's how powerful you are. And I don't think, I think, I think what we think is incidental is we just kind of walk around and say stuff to kids and oh, give me, you know, why do you have a master key or whatever it is? And we don't know that changes their lives. Haven't you, how many of you have been teaching 10 years or more? Haven't you had kids come back who you didn't think you made an impact on at all that tells you, you know, if it wouldn't be for you, I wouldn't be, you know, in med school? Yeah? It's not the ones we think. I want, to, I want to take credit for Larry Lang, the director, director of the United States Air Force Band. But I'm not sure he wasn't going to make it anyways. It may have been that kid that was just on the edge of quitting that I reached over and salvaged. And how about the ones I missed, yeah? So uh, when I look at what you do, you're so different than every other teacher in the school. I, one of my penances in life is I have to do all teacher in-services. For that kind of fun, you can just take a dull pencil and jam it in your eye real hard. <laughs> How many of you have those at school? All teachers, oh my God. Teachers hate them, don't they? Yeah. They hate them. You go in and you're already down four points and you got to get them back to even. So, <laughs> I look at you though. Do you know other teachers come to school when it starts in the day? <laughs> You've already been there an hour and a half, yeah? Other teachers leave school when the school ends. That's when you start. Other teachers... <laughs> on vacation breaks go away from their kids. We pack ours up and take them to Orlando, <laughs> convincing our wives or husbands that it'll be a romantic adventure to travel with 120 <laughs> middle schoolers and eat at Old Country Buffet. Yeah, we're... <laughs> You're nuts. Other teachers in the summer, they go out fishing and so forth, you know. Look where you are. And you paid to do it, by the way. Amazing. Haven't you ever done that where you go, okay, this is my time. I'm going to go fishing too. I get my tackle box. I get my pole. I get my Hal Leonard CDs. And I'm going to go out there and <laughs> fish or jumping in your boat. Yeah, get the hell out of here. I'm trying to listen. I'm trying to... We can play that song. So when I look at what you do and who you are, don't give me this whine that one person can't make a difference. Most of us are in this room because of one person, yes? 
One person hooked us, and we managed to get through ear training and piano proficiency. <laughs> how, many, how many of you went to college? This is where I went to school, so I got, you know, I'm kind of chills. How many of you went to college knowing how to play piano? How many of you went to college not knowing how to play piano? Now, that's not fair, is it? <laughs> See, most of us are one-line readers. Yeah, trumpets, one line. Tubas, one line. Percussion, one line. Piano, that's ten lines and two feet. Remember, what, did, you, did you have to play Star Spangled Banner? I remember asking Dr. Kohler, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Kohler, why are we playing the Star Spangled Banner? You know, piano <laughs> professors have no sense of humor about this at all because they know it's the instrument of God, right? And <laughs> he goes, because if you're ever going to amount to anything in music education, someday you will be asked to play our national anthem and you don't want to look like an idiot. I'm 70 years old. Nobody's ever asked me to play. And if they did, I just hit an A flat chord and go, let's do it a cappella gang. There you go, you're a pitcher. <laughs> and, and they had to play something by ear? Yeah, that's pretty easy. I, that was, but sight reading, there's the one, isn't it? Because there's all, there's all the lines going. We don't, not, not just our one line, they're all going. And there was always some little easy hymn, you know? And uh, you figure if you get that first chord set, you're kind of okay, man. Like, weld that sucker down. I remember him saying, Tim, we're not interested in how fast you play it. We're interested in how accurately you play it. So count off a tempo measure that's comfortable for you. And then, please, accuracy is what we're after. One. <laughs> and. month and a half later, I finished the hymn. So, <laughs> we're only laughing because it's what? It's true. It's true. This is how important you are. Uh, I, I was doing a leadership workshop in the country of Texas a couple years ago, and you're going to have to be faster than that, folks, if you want to get this stuff. <laughs> there's a whole auditorium floor full of kids, alleged leaders, right? And up in the balcony are the directors. They're leaning over watching their kids. So I go through this whole nonsense. I said, how many of you think your band, orchestra, choir, whatever it is, could get better? Every hand goes up. I said, how many of you think for your group to get better, something's got to change? Every hand goes up. I said, how many think what has to change is something you can purchase? So they figure out. It doesn't make any difference if we get new this or new that or a truck or anything else. It's inside. What's behind and what's ahead is nothing. It's what's inside. How many think it's something you can purchase? And you know, you hear the hush of the crowd, and this girl puts her hand up. I'm like, oh, gosh, I'm smart. I like high school. And she's just looking at me like, you're going to call on me or not? I said, stand up. Stood up. I said, band, choir, orchestra, what is it? She goes, band. I said, sweetheart, what could you possibly buy that would make your band better? She said, a new director. <laughs> well, she's right. What do you want me to say? <laughs> she's seen the director up in the balcony going like, was that my kid? Was that my kid? Was that my kid? That said <laughs> I kind of eased over and I said, well, come and see me afterwards. We'll talk. I watched her during the workshop. She was on it from the get-go. Kid was on it. So it wasn't a smart aleck situation. Afterwards, come up, and I started talking to her. She goes, you go ahead and talk to everybody else. I'll wait. We get done. I walked over, and I put my arm around her, and I said, you know, I appreciate the fact you had the guts to say it. But I said, it was really precocious. I said, how, how do you think your director felt when you said that? She said, my director's not here. I said, I'm sorry? She goes, he would never come to anything like this. She said, in fact, he makes fun of you all the time. Well, I said, how did you get here? She said, my cousin lives three houses down, and that puts her in a different school district, and they have a phenomenal music program. So every time you come to town, my cousin tells me, I go there, and then she starts crying. And I'm not talking about dripping tears. I'm talking <laughs> this kind, you know. And I said, my God, I said, are you okay? She goes, no, I'm not okay. She said, this is my senior year, and our band's going to suck again. I didn't know what to tell her. 
I, I played this card. I said, well, maybe, maybe your cousin, you know, they have like better instruments and facilities. She goes, don't tell me that. She goes, my cousin goes to the poor school. I go to the rich school. She said, we have everything we could possibly want. She said, they're taping their instruments together. And they're phenomenal. And Mr. Williams is magical. That's how important you are. And you know what? That little girl's never going to get a shot at great music making and great music learning. Never. And I, I, didn't know, I just kept my arm around her and let her cry. So every time we think, well, maybe it doesn't, maybe I really don't have any impact. On, oh, stop. You are the ones that do have the impact on the world. Your kids are going to be the doctors and the lawyers. They're going to be the people that go on and be the senators. It's, they're the ones that do it. And it's because of what you teach them. I was telling the kids last night, I want every kid to make music every day. I want all of us to make music every day. I want that whole community out there to make music every day, but I know they're not going to. But you know what they are going to do? They're going to live life. And if they use the same set of excellent standards that you bring to them in music, they're going to adapt them to every other part of life. Oh, you've all heard it, haven't you? All the smart kids are in music. It's not true. What is true is once they join music, they become the smart kids. You change them. You change the way their mind works. A, a, a drummer, I'm a drummer, it makes it worse. A drummer should never explain neurology, but here's how it works, right? <laughs> We're born with about 200 million brain cells. That's what we're born with. Where's, where's other percussionists in here besides me? We're down a couple mil, but it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. We'll generate it here somewhere along the way. You can actually grow more brain cells. We didn't know this till 2004, when they could actually, they had an MRI machine strong enough to watch the mind work. You can actually grow more brain cells. That gives me hope. I don't know about you. But the, here's what happens. When you have a thought an electrical impulse fires and connects two of those cells. It's called a, dan a dendrite, a mind map. Musicians have about five times more dendrites than non-musicians. And here's the reason why. We used to think that everything you learned was in there somewhere, yeah? How many of you took algebra in high school? How many of you couldn't pass an algebra test right now if you had to? Where did it go? How about music history? You want to run that one around? <laughs> because what we did was learn enough to take the test, yes? And we went in, took the test, had it right on the edge of the hippocampus, right? Went in, took the test, walked out and went, delete, I won't use that anymore. But here's the key. Whenever you learn anything with music, and we don't know why, we just know this happens, the, the mind does a thing called myelinate. It puts a coating around that mind map and it lasts for almost ever. Amazing, isn't it? That is the same scaffolding and template that they put on history and English and math and everything else. Nice, smarter, they use more of their mind because, because the music trains them. N E S T L E S. What do they make? Now we know who the old people are in here. <laughs> Has it been on television for 42 years? <laughs> Look, people going, ah, oh, crap, I wish I knew. <laughs> Winston tastes good like a... There's people in this room that didn't even know they ever had cigarette commercials on television. But that little jingle's still in there, isn't it? Right? Um, ah, uh ha, -huh. just do old anxiety on ah, uh, two, three. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Stop, we're going to use the same key and see how it sounds like that. <laughs> oh, oh, two, three. Good, give me some energy. How about some harmony? Ooh, that's nice. Keep giving. How did you do that? 
Did, did, did they put a version of Old Lang Syne in there that had 111 part harmony? <laughs> no, you did it because it's in there. You're the same people that don't know where your car keys are right now, <laughs> or how a budget works, or how a purchase order works. How's that one? Did you ever wonder, how's that happen? I write it down, give it to that guy, symbols show up two weeks later. How does that happen? Can you do it with humans? Can I get one of those, right? How did you know how to sing Old Lang Syne? How did you know when I said, give me some harmony to split that way? How did you know that, that some people going, you want the fifth, I'll take the third? How, I mean, come on. Because that stuff lasts forever. Haven't you ever been da driving down the street and you hear one of those tunes that... For when you're growing up, you know, sitting on a dock by the bay, and you're like, and you know all the words, you know, and your kids are going, what the crap is wrong with you? And you miss the turn off because you're singing, man. We're going to take that away from a kid. We know that after about 14 or 15, that the way the mind grows, if we haven't inserted music learning in there by now, it's probably not going to happen. Doesn't mean you can't learn music after that time, but it's much harder. That's how important you are. If you don't get them, they aren't going to get got. You're the ones that let that kid know also that maybe I could, may, I mean, maybe I could actually do better in history. Maybe I, if I can do this, maybe I could do that. Uh, you're never supposed to read to them, people. That's an insult of intelligence, but I'm going to read this to you now. <laughs> It says, one day a small child, Thomas Edison, came home from school and gave a paper to his mother. He said to her, my teacher gave me this paper and told me only you are supposed to read it. What's it say? His mother's eyes welled with tears as she read the letter aloud. Quote, your son is a genius. This school is too small for him and doesn't have good enough teachers to train him. Please teach him yourself. Many years after his mother had died, he became one of the greatest inventors of the century. One day he was rummaging through her closet and he found that folded letter his teacher had sent to his mother. He opened it. The message on the letter said, quotes, your son is mentally deficient. We cannot let him attend our school any longer. He is expelled. Edison started to cry. And then he wrote in his diary, Thomas A. Edison was a mentally deficient child whose mother turned him into the genius of a century. Positive word of encouragement can change someone's life. Come on. That's what you do. You change lives. I just, I wish that we knew while we were doing it, particularly young teachers, what the manifestation is along the way. I'm, I, I'm going to use Larry Lang because he was one of the, I, I kicked him out of band one time too, so. Colonel Lang from the Air Force. When we were doing Midwest, Dr. Dunham's over there, we were doing Midwest Clinic, and, and the Air Force Band was the future group. And Larry called and he said, uh, would you guest conduct the Air Force Band? <laughs> if I have to, I suppose I could bail you out one more time. <laughs> well, my guy, it's like driving a musical Ferrari. You just barely move your hands and the color changes. Oh my God, it's what we all hope for, right? So I did my little tune. They were just so nice. And then I went backstage and I watched him. Oh my God, he's phenomenal. He is phenomenal. And that band just played their holy tails off. So when it's done, of course, there's a standing ovation and they're throwing babies at him and all this sort of thing. And I'm standing there and I'm crying and he comes running off the stage knowing he's gonna get three or four callbacks, yeah? And he runs up and he gives me a big hug. And I said, I'm so proud of you. And he stood back and he goes, what'd you think? Was it any good? Are you deaf? <laughs> and I asked him later, I said, why, why did you ask me that? He said, I want to please my teacher. I start crying. I said, I'll cry now. They want to please you. If we can ever get to the point, gang, that we can ever set our egos aside, and realize that the gift of music we have, if purify it and just give it to every kid we can, we're there. That ego's a goofy little thing, isn't it? Gets in our way, gets in my way, don't worry. My wife and I were at a yard sale. God knows why we were there. And I'm walking around trying to be nice because I, 
I know that I'm supposed to be doing this as part of the family. And I walk up, walk up to a table, and one of my books is on the table at this yard sale. <laughs> and I, I said to the lady, I said, uh, how much for the book? She said, a quarter. <laughs> a quarter? She goes, okay, a dime. No, no, you're going the wrong direction. <laughs> And I said, really? A dime? She goes, just take it. It's not that good anyways. <laughs> and your ego jumps in there, right? Instead of saying, sure. That's why when people go, oh, Tim, what do you say to all those people who make fun of you and say it's all just smoke and mirrors and fluff and fury? All that stuff you do really doesn't make any difference. Just, just pretend. What do you say to those people? I say they're exactly right. Because they're right for them, aren't they? Try to make a Catholic out of a Lutheran, I dare you. There will be people that will leave this week that will walk out and go, that is the most compelling week of my life. And right behind them will be somebody going, it's kind of a waste of money, I didn't get anything out of it. And it will have nothing to do with the content. It will have to do with the filter of attitude that it goes through, yes? Don't you work with teachers that regardless of what happens, it's never good? And there's other teachers that the building can be on fire and they're like, hey, weenie roast, let's go, let's take advantage of this. <laughs> whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're always right. So, you get to hang out with people like Buck. You get to hang out with the clinicians in here who are phenomenal. You get, you get to nuzzle up beside Gary and David and all those people. For God's sakes, do it. Because they've been to the well, they've tasted it. And they'll tell you, don't go this way, don't go that way. It's all a matter of attitude. The company I work for, we had a, I, now you can't tell, I'm going to tell 220 people a secret here. We had a six-figure job. You know what a six-figure job is? 100,000 or more. Six-figure job open. Three people interviewed. One had a PhD. One had a marketing resume that looked like she could walk on water. And then the president let one of the little volunteers we use in the summer because he said, she, she's neat and she just needs the experience. So they go through the interview. The little volunteer finds out he likes peaches. The next day he walks into his office and there's a little basket of peaches and a handwritten note saying, thank you for letting me have this experience. You didn't have to do this. She got the job. And I argued. I said, N stop. I said, she doesn't know what she's doing. He goes, I know. But with an attitude like that, I can teach her. I can't teach people attitude. So I said, okay, in six months, you're going to be sorry. Because her evaluation is going to show that she's in way over her head. You know what she did the next six months? She got one of the highest evaluations ever. Because she went around to everybody in that corporate headquarters and found out what they liked and delivered it. You know, she's a success. Now, is she the smartest card in the deck? Nope. But I'll tell you what. When I want somebody to work with, I'm going to take her because I know that kid will stay at it till she gets it. I'm going to give you two students to work with. This one here has a great amount of talent, but a suck stale pond water attitude. This one over here is mediocre talent, but a great attitude. Do you want one or do you want two? Which? Two. Well, sure you do because that's the easy one to work with, isn't it? You know who the real teacher wants? Both of them. You go, why? Why would I want this jerk over here? Here it is. Because you cannot change the amount of innate talent a person has. What we get is what we get. You can buff it, you can polish it, you can stretch it a little bit, but who we are is who we are. But a good teacher will change a kid's attitude, yeah? And if I think I'm strong enough that I can get next to that kid and change his or her attitude, I can tap into that talent and bring it to everybody. That's the one that's going to make you the good teacher. These over here, phew. But people don't like change. So how many, well, you've all taken over for somebody, haven't you? How many took over for somebody? You took somebody, and did you hear the kids the next year? We didn't do it that way last year. And you're like, well, you're going to do it this way this year, by God. Well, Mr. Williams, well, Mr. Williams is dead now, so let's not talk about Mr. Williams. <laughs> you know why? We don't like change. Did you hear people grumbling when I moved them over here? Because we don't like change. So somebody begged me to do this, so I'll do it. Got your feet flat on the floor? Good. Uh, pull up to the front of the chairs just a little bit. Turn your butt so you're facing this direction. Good. Take your shoes and socks. I'm just teasing. 
Take your hands and put them together like that. Now, my guess is you didn't have to think about it. Is that right? You didn't have to go, now, wait, 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 wait. You just went chunk because your mind maps have always done that. See if your left thumb's on top or your right thumb's on top. How many had your left thumb on top? How many had your right thumb on top? Which is correct, left or right? Now, if you say, if you say your own, you're back to I, me. It's just the way you... Where are my left thumbers? There's not one ounce of research on this, so don't get too excited. But you're supposed to be good lovers. <laughs> Two guys changed up there. Just like... Hey. <laughs> How many had your right thumb on top? I got good news for you, too. You're supposed to be good thinkers. Good thinkers, good lovers, good lovers, good thinkers. Anybody do it like that? Did you? That means you think you're a good lover. If you do it like that, you put those... <laughs> cowbell, cowbell. Where's my cowbell, right? Take your hands apart, reset your fingers the other way, put the other thumb on top. How does it feel? Weird. What do you want to do? You either want to go back or quit, yeah? That's the way that kid feels. How many of you do marching band? Why? <laughs> do you ever stand out there and go, what the devil am I doing? Who, what band director came up with that idea, right? Said to a kid, you're having trouble sitting there playing your horn. Let's go outside. Here we go. Can you do it going backwards like that? I know. I have a love-hate relationship with it. You know what? And those kids, those first few days, I mean, that's scary. Now watch this. Take your hands apart like that, about like that. The minute I say go, clasp them together as fast as you can. Go! How many went the old way? Put them up. I want to see. Majority of the room. And that's what happens. We come, we learn from these wonderful people. We go back out, we go back to the old way. You plant corn, what are you going to get? Corn. You plant tomatoes, what are you going to get? You don't plant anything, what are you going to get? No, you're going to get weeds. You go out and stir that ground up out there. It's going to be weeds. What instrument? I knew it. <laughs> One of my people, right? So the point is you have to plant something differently. And here's the opportunity with some great seeds around here to do it. Now, let's do it. These, these are fun. You can take them home, play them with the kids. Take your hands, put them like this. One up, one down. One up, one down. See which is up, see which is down. Got it? Good. Take your hands apart. Shake. Reset them the other way. Right? You see people going like, oh. <laughs> this is stupid. I came here to learn. Right? Go back first way. Go the new way. You'll learn to do it. We can do it. Just like you learn to go over the break of the clarinet. Just like you learn third position. Just like, just like, just like. Oh God, you're so important. And again, I, this is not Tim's passion. This is just reality. You got the leaders of tomorrow. You got the kid in your group that's got the wherewithal to cure cancer. And if we don't trigger that creative mind, it ain't going to happen. And now, I, if I were sitting where you were, and I wouldn't be because I wouldn't be smart enough to come to this thing, I would be saying, is Tim up there screaming and yelling and thinks that everybody can be great? Uh, pretty much. There's a, few, there's a few that are pathological that can't, not, not the kids you deal with. So then why doesn't everybody just succeed, right? This is the reason. Take your hands and clap like applause, really loud, really loud. Let's go. Come on. Good. Do, woo, nice release. <laughs> Do it again, one more time, listen. Good, that's the way you've done it your whole life. Turn your hands the other way. You see people, ah, ah, ah. And listen, go. Go back the first way. Switch. First way. Switch. I should let you do this, you've done it enough times, right? Amazing, isn't it? And it's what David said. Take your hands, put them like this. You can play it with the kids. When I say push, push them together as hard as you can. Ready, go, push. Hard. No, I mean nail it, push. Stop, it's stupid. <laughs> Who are you pushing against? Yourself. It's ridiculous. It's like screaming at a principal that already doesn't like you. We just stir it up. Come on. People don't get better by making them feel worse. I was doing, again, back to Texas. I was doing the director's workshops, and there's one of the directors, in, and this, this was the body language. <sighs> uh, 
So at the break, I mean, everybody's on G, he's on G sharp, right? So at the break, I pull him aside and I said, you know, I don't seem to be connecting and this information doesn't seem relative to you. And he, and he goes, nah. He said, that's not the way I motivate kids. Well, I said, how do you motivate them? He said, I just kick them in the, till they get it. He said, their job is to play. Their job isn't to like me or to me to like them. I said, well, what could we talk about in the last session that would be relevant to you? He goes, I have problems with retention. <laughs> Do you ever see your dog when they don't understand going like, he didn't get it. He did, I mean, he didn't even connect the dots. Probably has a good band. Probably not many people. We've got to connect the dots. What is it Maya Angelou said? They won't remember what you said. They won't remember what you did. They'll remember how you made them feel. And that's what you do. You're the last, you're the last expressionistic class in the school day. Everything else is impressionistic. That's why I get upset when I hear people go, well, you know, music is just like sports. No, it's not. How many played sports? How many benched sports? Right. If you weren't good enough, you didn't get on the floor. There's only five guys on that basketball floor. Only 11 guys on that field out there. Right? We'll take anybody, won't we? If you could fog a mirror, we'll get you in there somewhere, right? <laughs> I just got kicked out of school for selling drugs. We have a percussion section. Come on, we can make this, <laughs> we can make this work one more time, man. My person. I love it. You'll bend the rules for anybody, won't you? <laughs> Some kid walks in. You're like, don't interrupt. Where are you from? Oh, I'm a transfer student. Well, You've interrupted, where are you from? Texas. Wait, no, wait, wait, stop. Here, wait. <laughs> How good are you? Well, I was in Allstate three years. And why'd you get kicked out? Oh, I was doing drugs and selling drugs. That's okay. Come on, come on, come on. We have fundraisers. This is a win-win. You get in there. Like, like. <laughs> We're only laughing because it's what? True. It's true. Dang it. You are so good. It's not like sports. No. In sports, they have a bench. Do you have a bench? God, wouldn't you like to have a bench during a concert? I mean, wouldn't that be great? It's just like, Jeff out, Stewart, in for Jeff. <laughs> Rest your lips, Jeff. We're going to put you in a letter G. No. We'll take them all. And, then, and, then, and then when it's all done and you look back and you, at 11 o'clock at night, finally go, oh, God, I'm so tired. You can also say, I made a difference. And I think that's what we all want our lives to do. All in our lives to make a difference. Can you make a difference? Because you know them. They're not just a class for you. They're not just isolated names. Now, I said I went to school here at Ball State, and everybody that went to college knows there's always this complaint about, they don't even care about us. We're just a number. Right? Remember that old rattle? So our Find Me Alpha, which was a very strong chapter, we had a house. We had our own house. And we had a St. Bernard that was our mascot. <laughs> God, I can't believe I'm telling you this. And at that time, Ball State, we were on a quarter system. It cost $90 a quarter to go to school here. So we all chipped in and enrolled the dog in school. This fictitious character named Bernard Saint. And every <laughs> midterm and final, one of the brothers who was really good in whatever classes the dog was taking would go in and take the midterm and the final. He made the dean's list every quarter. <laughs> and he'd get his, he would get his letter, we're so proud you represent what Ball State is all about. <laughs> so I, th I think we could have graduated the beast, except we had him in the School of Education, and he had to go for his student teaching interview. <laughs> and we took him and the school newspaper with us. And that lady goes, next Bernard Saint. You go get him, boy, you go there. <laughs> you don't do that. You don't do that. You know them all by name. You know that when their grandma died, you know, you know that stuff. You know the inside guts of it. And that's why they come back. I mean, I don't know how much louder a kid can yell, I love you, but to be in marching band. I mean, their friends are down there swimming and making out and all that stuff, 
and they're on a pavement doing the same 16 counts over and over, and you're threatening them with water. <laughs> and they do it. My God. You can't, you can't get adults to work that hard. And, and then all you got to do is go, kids, you know, I'm just really disappointed. Oh, we'll get it, we'll get it. And off they go. So again, don't ever diminish what you do. If anything, we need to amplify it. And that means we need to make changes. This is by Heim Gannott, maybe the best educator ever was. He said, I've come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in the classroom, that it's my personal approach that creates the climate, that it's my daily mood that makes the weather. I possess a tremendous power to make a life miserable and joyous. I can be a tool of torture. I can be an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate them or I can humor them. I can hurt them or I can heal them. But in all situations, it will be my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated and a child humanized or dehumanized. You know, I, did anybody come from uh, a teachers who were mean and yelled and threw things? My hand is in the air. And sadly... We don't teach as we're taught to teach. We teach as we're taught, yes? So when I first started teaching, oh, by golly, I just emulated, and you all knew him, my teacher. And he would scream, if you can't play the horn, sell it. I'm like, oh, my God. So first time I stood in front of my wind ensemble, the little bassoon player didn't like me, and I didn't like her. She liked the former band director, and I was just waiting for her to make a mistake, and she cacked on a note one day. I looked down, I said, if you can't play the horn, you might as well sell it. And she got up and walked out. I'm like, oh, God. Come, I'll buy you a car. Come back, come back, come back, come back. <laughs> Not a bassoon within 200 miles of here, right? And I, I keep coming back to this. But comes between being right and being kind. Let's choose kind, yeah? We can always go back and be right, but you can't always go back and be kind. And for many kids, that's where their safest place in the world is in your rehearsal room, yes? How many have kids that come in the morning, or you go in the morning, there's just kids sitting around waiting for you to get in there? Are they in the chemistry lab? Huh? They got a shirt on that says Geometry Pride across the back? <laughs> How many have kids that get passes, get out of class, come down there? How many after school have kids meet down there? How many of you were one of those geeks that did that? Absolutely. <laughs> How many of your social friends were in the band or choir? Actually? Anybody ever marry one of them? No, it is a cult for sure. There's no question about that. <laughs> I shouldn't tell you this stuff. The other day I was doing a, 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 an in-service, and there was a young kid, new teacher up front, and he's just like, he's just slobbering like a puppy. He's just like, <laughs> and he's writing notes just frantically. And so afterwards he comes out. You love people like that if you're a speaker. I mean, because you're looking, they're going, oh, I get it, I get it, right? So he comes up afterwards and he goes, I got to tell you something. He said, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. Well, that makes you feel good, doesn't it? And I said, well, what a nice thing to say. I said, did you read some of the books I wrote? He goes, no. He said, I didn't even know you wrote books. Huh. I said, are, are you a music person? He goes, no, no, I'm an English teacher. But he said, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. I said, okay, scoop me. He said, in 1983, you did a student leadership workshop in Cleveland, Ohio. And kids came from different bands, and they put them together. And one of the things you did was you got them up and mixed them so they sat beside people they didn't know. He said, it's the first time my parents met. <laughs> I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. What do you think? Fair? Good. So we don't know, do we? We don't know what those little instances will make. Now, i got to give you an exercise you can take home and play with the kids, because several of you have asked. So uh, get a partner. Just get a partner. Just say somebody, you're my partner. Take forever to... You can't share partners. That's illegal in the United States. There's an ethical thing about that. Now, I'm telling you this. I'm giving you this. So when their, their lips get so tired that they can't play anymore at band camp, you can set them down. Here's, here's the breakdown I see. And this is the stuff I talk about nobody else wants to talk about. We are doing clinics and giving information with the assumption they want to learn. We think they're all going to be there on the edge of their chairs wanting to learn. So we get all of this content, and I'm back in here going, no, no. we got to get the lid to the salt shaker off so they can learn, yeah? 
That's not an assumption from the end. We've got we to fire them up some way. So this is one of the things you can do. Uh, take your partner's right hand. Just grab it there. Good. If you need to go find somebody that's a partner, just go find somebody. It's no big deal. Good. You can let go of their hand unless you just want to touch or whatever. <laughs> You're fun. You guys laugh. I had a faculty the other day. Didn't laugh. Well, they laughh. They laugh like this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> Decide between you and your partner who's one and who's two. No, we don't need a faculty meeting to do this. Just call it. I mean, right? Number ones, I'd like you to hold your right hand to the number twos like that. Hold it right at them. Hold it right at them. Number twos, I would like you to make a fist with your right hand and lay it gently in the palm of their hand. Thank you. Number twos, do exactly what I tell you to do. Number ones, do what you think you should do. Number twos, begin to add some gentle pressure. Add a little bit more. Even more, smart man. Even more. Good, stop. Would this half of the room over here watch them do it? Would you do it one more time so they can see it? Ready, gentle pressure. More, more, more. Stop, you guys watch, you guys do. Ready, and gentle pressure. More, all you got. Stop, good, reverse the rolls. Two's open, one's fist. Here we go, gentle pressure. More, more, stop. How many of you, when you pushed, they started pushing back right away? And we're back to this thing, aren't we? Right? Resistance. And you go, well, Tim, see, this is the thing. We just saying, now, do you know how that 3-8 measure is going to work? That ain't going to do it. People only listen to what's relevant to their perceived survival. If you think all this stuff I'm talking about is nonsense, it is nonsense for you. All I'm doing is convincing people of it. If it's not relevant to what you think should be, then we check it off. We go somewhere else in our minds. So there's the problem. When we push, people want to push back. Now, you've done this too many times. Come on, Brian, you, you've done it too. So here we go. Good. Put your right hand up. He's the band, he's the orchestra, he's the choir. I'm the director, yeah? Okay, the first time, just watch your own hand, Brian. Keep your eyes right on your hand. Follow my hand with your hand. Are you watching your hand? Okay, I'm watching my hand. Isn't this what we're doing? I've got my score in front of me. Now you watch your music. Okay, are you ready? Just follow my hand. Keep watching your hand, Brian. Good God. What instrument do you play? Percussion. Oh, dear God. <laughs> Cats. <laughs> Gotta be faster than that. Two drummers up here. Isn't this sad? What are the odds of that? It looks like it looks like it's his fault. And I can make it look like his fault. You know why? I've got the microphone. I'm on the podium. It's the last bastion of dictatorship, and I've got it. And I go, can't you keep up? Didn't you practice? Why are you wasting their time? It was a simple part. All I asked you to do was follow me. And inside, that little voice going, push, push, push. Or, I don't have to do this. This isn't a required subject for me. That guy gets out of my face. I was telling the kids today, you know what the number one fear of, of teenagers is, don't you? Being embarrassed in front of their friends. That's the number one fear. You know where death is on their fear scale? Six. They would rather die than do in the subject of what I just did to him. Making fun of him and everything. It's not his fault. It's my fault. We're going to make a switch here, buddy. We're going to go to we us. You watch my hand. I'll watch yours. Do whatever my hand does. Good, Brian. Just keep doing what my hand does. He really got good, didn't he? He'll do stuff he wasn't going to do before. There you go. Good. Bye. Give him a good hand. He did a good job. Good, good job. The minute... The minute I put the attention on him instead of me, the chances are we're going to get it. The minute it's only about me, no, nope. ego, ego on the wall, right? So, face partner, ones, you're going to be the leaders. Twos, you're going to be the followers. The first time through, only watch your own hand. And Brian will tell you you're going to want to cheat. Don't cheat. Okay, ones, go for it. Go for it, ones. You got to challenge them. Come on. Good stuff. You guys are great. 
This, this half the room, watch them, watch them. Do it again, do it again so they can see it. Ready, do it, go. Isn't that the dumbest thing you ever saw in your life? <laughs> Good stuff, you guys watch, you guys do. Ready, go. Stop, doesn't that look like a faculty meeting? I mean, really, is that right? Where, where, where's my number twos, where's my number twos? Be honest, does it feel good or bad? You know what people do when they feel bad? They run back to where it's safe. And that may be out of our rehearsal room and into the soccer team. Now, does that mean you run around blowing sunshine up people's shorts? No. Come on, there's nothing worse than false praise. But there's a way to do it. So you don't diminish the human creature. And you say, and some, everybody says, what do I do with that kid that's just a horse's rear all the time? You pull him aside and you go, okay, Jeff, we're not making it. Tell me what I need to do to make this work for you. But if this behavior keeps going on, we're, we're going to have to find a way to make music in a different way. Because I can't leave you in the group. Okay, buddy? What's it going to take? I got your back. Put the twos in charge. Play the same game. Now, understand, number ones, the twos are ticked off right now. <laughs> Ready? Watching your own hands. Go for it. Go for it. Good, stop. You guys are great. Here's the ones, here's the ones. Twos are like, son of a bitch, I'm gonna make me look like a fool, I'll make you look like a Abuse children, abuse their children, right? Because that's all we know. So we gotta stand back and go, how do I get harmony? How do I, you know, okay kids, we're gonna do it one more time. Ah, oh, God, no! And that takes up a lot of time. Because the only thing that makes us equal is 24 hours a day. How do we use it the best? Put the ones in charge again. Watch each other's hands. Whatever you do, don't lose them. Ready, go. Don't lose them. Now you got a challenge too. You can't just stay on whole notes forever. Good, twos take over. Twos you take over, twos. Good, stop. This half of the room, you watch. Twos do it the right way so they can see you do it. Go, twos. I want you to notice something. It's the same energy. It's just focused differently. Unbelievable, the difference. Ready? You guys watch. You guys do so they can see it. Ready? Go. I rest my case. Stop. The minute we put the attention off ourselves onto somebody else, it's not 100% but the chances are they'll follow us. And if it's all about energy going in, no worry, guilty as charged. I've shredded some people. I mean, it, because that's all I, that's the only tool I had. And somehow I watched other people scream and yell at kids and the group would get better. And I go, well, they're better. But the retention wasn't there. We got to know each other, gang. I was just with a, a little drum corps a couple days ago. Sweetest little kids in the world. They're called the Blue Devils. And they were... The first time I stood in front of them, I'm like, what can I tell you guys? You're the best. I mean, half of them are going to be music teachers, yeah? And the first time I stood in front, I said, where, where are the sopranos? Where's the trumpets? They were all together. I said, where's the contras? They were all together. Where's the color guard? They were all together. Where's the percussion? They were all together. I said, you don't know each other's first names, do you? And boy, that room got quiet. And so we started mixing. I said, do you understand percussion? When you smack that rim shot and the bass drum and the gong and there's that explosion that at the same time those flags are flying up behind you, do you know that's what's happening? And they're like, oh, we're just doing what they told us to do. And I said, do you know when those rifles hit and boom, you hear that? Did that's on purpose? And the rifles are going, I, I wasn't even listening. Once they got that, you get the answer to the game, which is to become one with the other person. That we want that group so in, so close, so intimate, that when we're conducting and we go, the music goes, Wah. or if we go, you can feel the group go, 
right? That's what we want. They're not going to come into that space unless they trust us. And if they get their head ripped off, they aren't going to trust us. Because it's still about feeling. It's still about saying something with a language that you can't say any other way. There's a, this is a, 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 a letter that E.E. E. Cummings wrote to a young man. The kid wrote him and he said, I want to be a poet. You're the best poet I know. How do I do it? And this is what E.E. E. Cummings wrote back to him. And I want you to watch him shift from context to content, from content to context, right? Content, we can get a lot of it. You can Google that one. Context is us, right? That's what we portray. It's what we push forward. He says, dear young man, a poet is somebody who feels and who expresses his feelings through words. This may sound easy to you, but it, 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 is, it isn't. A lot of people, now here he goes to content, think or believe or know that they feel. But that's thinking or believing or knowing. That's not feeling. Poetry is feeling. Music, yeah. It's not thinking or believing or knowing. Not a single human being can ever be taught how to think or believe or to know to the feeling that you want. Whenever you think or you believe or you know, you're a lot of other people. But the moment you feel, you're nobody but yourself. And to be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its very best night and day to make everybody look alike means to fight the hardest battle that any human being can fight. And you can never stop fighting. As for expressing nobody but yourself in words, that means working just a little bit harder than any poet can possibly imagine. Why? Oh, this is gorgeous. Because there's nothing quite as easy as using words like somebody else. We, all of us, do it most of the time. And whenever we do, we're not poets. So at the end of your first 10 or 15 years of fighting and working and feeling, if you find you've written one line of one poem, I would say you're very lucky indeed. So my advice to all young people who wish to become poets is, no, do something easy, like learn to blow up the world, unless you're not only willing, but you're glad to feel and to work and to fight until you die. If this sounds dismal, it isn't. It's the most wonderful life on earth, or so I feel. God, isn't that gorgeous? And I go, okay, Jim. Where does it get back to where it feels? Where does it get back to where you look at the kid and because that kid is not doing what you want him to do, you jam him instead of saying, what's going on behind his or her eyes? Well, if we do, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know, maybe we are. Okay, last thing and then we'll get out of here because people are screaming for this story. Everybody know, everybody know Dick Dunscombe? Huh? You know? You have a great hand. We got a celeb here in the... How you doing? Good? All right. So here's, here's the story, because you just, everybody's screaming, you got to do this. I can't believe it's been this long. We remember the best times of our life and the worst times of our life, yeah? If I said, what were you doing April 13th, uh, 2009, unless it's your birthday or something, you probably couldn't remember. How about this date? September 11th, 2001. How many remember it? Yeah. For a lot of people, that's a bad day. It's a good day for me. I flew in from Oklahoma City to St. Louis, getting ready to do a workshop over at the University of Missouri. And all the planes are backed up, and Gary knows this. We're horrible business travelers. They're like, what? Get us to the gate. What's going on? And, blah, blah, blah. and finally they said, you can turn your cell phones on. This is before you were allowed to. And I turned the cell phone on, and Andrea, my wife, was after me. And she, called, she goes, where are you? And I said, I'm in a plane. She said, get off and get in the hotel right away. I said, what are you talking about? She said, the United States has been attacked. I'm like, oh, Andrea, you're hallucinating. We're the United States. Nobody ever attacks. She goes, Tim, just trust me. And I remember we finally got to the gate, and I was walking through looking at the sports bars and, and watching. They were showing the television with the, you know, the planes going into the, how many know what I'm talking about? Those planes going into the towers, and they just kept showing it over and over. And I'm like, my God, it's not more than I thought it was. It was more than I could think. I, my mind doesn't go out that far. And so I said, okay, and I called, and, and I said, um, well, we obviously, because they were closing the schools, yeah? I said, they obviously aren't going to have a workshop tonight. She goes, oh, yeah, you are. She goes, your crazy band director friends, they got the kids out of school. They got a hold of them. You're going to have a huge workshop tonight. And we did, and it was great. 
day after that, I'm supposed to be, the day after, after that, I'm supposed to be in Phoenix, Arizona. We have a huge one there. They, they fill the auditorium for that one, about 1,100 kids. And I said, well, what are we going to do? They're not going to fly. They're shutting it down. Maybe I'll call Fran. And, well, no, he has to fly too. And I'm, I'm like, those people, some have already started on the way there. She goes, I, I don't know. Because she goes, the planes aren't going to go. So now here's the way a band director thinks. Drummers too, right? I said, how far is it? You know what I'm thinking, don't you? She goes, what? I said, get on MapQuest. See how far it is. She click, 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 click. 1,282 miles from St. Louis to Phoenix. She goes, I know what you're thinking. You're going to try to drive it, aren't you? I said, yeah, I can do that. She said, Tim, do you know how fast you would have to go average to get there? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> click, 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 click. 82 miles an hour. <laughs> well, I can do that. I mean, come on. I thought it was going to be something impossible. So I just get in that rental car and I start going west, yeah? I, I burned that car up, right? Well, after you drive fast for a while, it doesn't seem like you're driving fast, right? So I'm like, okay, I'm bored. I can't listen to the radio because we we're going to blow up the whole world and I know one of that. I'm like, oh, I've got a multi -tail. Wait, I've got an honor band coming up and I have not looked at the score. I'll just put it right on that dashboard. <laughs> Four lane highway, I got a little margin. And I'm, hmm. <laughs> so I'm going like a bat out of snot, right? And I figured if I didn't eat or didn't drink, I wouldn't have to stop and go to the bathroom. A couple of grass fill up, so I'd make it in time, right? So I'm, I'm going across the top of Texas, right across the top of Amarillo, and as I'm going west, there's a state patrolman coming this way. And I'm like, no! And I looked in the rearview mirror and down in the medium it goes and up in the bubbles and sirens. I'm like, guys, dang it, I'm trying to help you. I pulled over. And who's from Texas here? I don't want to offend, but they walk different down there. <laughs> here, here he comes. He goes, where now are you going, boy? I said, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. He goes, what's that on the dashboard? And I said, uh, it's a music score. It's a band score. He goes, you know something about music? I said, a little bit. He goes, you know something about band? I said, a little bit. And he reached in and he put a death grip on my shoulder. And he goes, are you a music teacher? And I said, I am. And he, he goes, you change people's lives. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm, dude, I've been without sleep too long here. And I said, I'm sorry. He goes, my son plays trombone in the Amarillo High School Band. And I said, well, that's great. And he said, you know, he said, before he got playing that trombone, he said, we think the kid was mixed up in drugs and everything. He said, he got in that band. He said, that's all he talks about. Bam, 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 bam. He said, he wants a new trombone for Christmas. You think that's a good idea? Oh, I said, it's a great idea. He said, well, maybe you can help me. He said, his mother and I know nothing about music. And he said, we don't know what kind of trombone to get him. I had my Bach business card right there in my pocket. <laughs> I hand it to him, and he looks, and he goes, because it's like educational director, blah, 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 blah. He went, oh, my God. He said, this is my lucky day. And I'm thinking, no, no, no. <laughs> this is my lucky day. <laughs> he said, I'll be right back. So he's back, and I'm like, this is going to cost me three or $400. He'd clocked me at 93 or something like that. And he comes up with that ticket book, and he goes, now, what kind of trombone should I get him? <laughs> So I tell him, he goes, uh, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Phoenix. He goes, what time you got to be there? I said, 9 o'clock in the morning. He goes, ew, you know how fast you're going to have to drive? <laughs> it's getting faster the longer we're talking here, pal. He said, I cannot help you outside the state of Texas. But he said, there's only one state patrolman between here and the New Mexico border. And he said, I'll call him and tell him you're coming. He said, now he's going to be on the right. And he said... <laughs> He's looking for you. He said, he'll turn the lights on, hit your headlights three times. He said, he'll let you through. Now get out of here. <laughs> Yo, I'm on the Audubon, right? I go by. I see him. But he comes out, and he does one of those Dukes of Hazard spin arounds, and he's chasing me, and I pulled over, and he comes up, and he goes, are you Tom Larenhammer? <laughs> yep. He, he said, you're the guy my buddy picked up in Amarillo? I said, yep. He goes, he didn't get the number on that trombone for his kid. What is that thing? <laughs> he said, we're going to spot you all the way into Phoenix. I said, I don't know what that means. 
He said, well, you know how he told you about the headlight thing? I said, yeah. He said, they're watching for you. We'll get you there in time. Don't worry. I got there 20 minutes early. <laughs> I walked in. I splashed water in my face. Brad's heard this before. And I walked out on that stage, and there was 1,100 kids waving American flags, singing, this land is your land. I went, it, it's not going to get any better, Tim. That's the highlight right there. The coda to the story. Two years later, I was in Amarillo doing a workshop, and after it was done, this kind of goofy-looking kid came out, and he goes, well, I really had a good time. And I said, well, so did I. He said, uh, can I ask you a question? I said, yes. And he reached in his pocket, and he handed me my business card. He said, is this yours? And I said, is your dad a state patrolman? <laughs> he goes, yeah, you want to see my new trombone? <laughs> No other profession, no other profession would have happened. I don't know if that was divine guidance or providence or just stupid drummer luck, but I will always remember, you know, the way we take care of each other. How many said they're in this room because of a, a music teacher? And how many said you might not be in this room? Good. Just for a second, see that teacher's face in your mind. Now look up. Do you think they knew they were having that kind of impact on you? Yes or no? Shake your head one way or the other, say. I, I agree. I don't think they woke up in the morning going, today I will change this kid's life. I think they're just going, oh my God, it's only two weeks to the concert, and I, I mean, doing what they do. And you know what? And, and, and Gar, he will confirm this. Some of those people you just saw have been here at Bands of America, Music for All. And you know what? They, they heard the same rattle you just heard. And I told them, I said, someday there'll be people in this audience, and when I say, who's that person that made a difference for you? I said, they'll see you. And they're like, yeah, right, Tim, all your rah-rah stuff. But you just saw them. Time will go on. There'll be somebody doing a keynote speech for you sometime. They'll say, how many of you are here because of a music teacher, a band director, whatever? And those hands will go up. The person will say, can you see the person's face? in your mind and they'll see you they're looking at you right now they want to be just like you that's why they came here that's why you're here so every time we think we don't make a difference that's the biggest lie in the world because the key is one person does make a difference and the last thing you have to do is listen to me and my good brother over there who does a magnificent job taking care of that I beg you please stand up for what you believe don't be shy about it because you're the ones that are going to make tomorrow what it is.